and we're going to let the party start. Make sure that we're here. Cool. Hey, if this is your first time joining us for 30 days to 2500 bucks, welcome. And these are the rules. Typically, I will do the presentation. If there is something in the presentation that you want to ask a question about, just go ahead, type in your question. And when I come out of this, I'll answer it in the Q&A session. So with that, since it's 359, this is day 13 and it's another burner. We're going to get started. I need your word. I pledge to make myself better today than I was yesterday. Day by day, I will become the hustler I know I can be. I am all in. It is very, very important for you to program your mind for success every day. There are so many things that will come at you in terms of life that if you're not really focused on that, it's very easy to become sidetracked. It's very easy to get knocked off course. It's very easy to become lost. So you have to have some focus there. And you really, really, it, the onus is on you to make sure that you're straight. You know, no one's going to come wake you up. No one's going to come say, hey, it's time for you to be successful. That is your responsibility. Yeah, yesterday we had a few questions and I got a few emails about this control versus ownership. And I'm going to try to explain this as carefully as I can, because it's a little tricky and it took me a while to understand it because, you know, you hear the thing that the person who owns something's in a better situation. Sometimes that is true. Sometimes it's not. It really depends upon something called financial structure. I live in a neighborhood that I'm helping a friend. That's one of the reasons, like the video you'll see tomorrow, I was driving around. When I do the research, many of these homes are in an LLC. And they've been in an LLC for a long time when you check out the property records. And that got me to doing a little investigation, talking to people. Now, an LLC is a financial entity. It's not a person, but it almost behaves as a person. So essentially... You can have a home in an LLC and not own it, but control it and still receive benefits. So that's what I'm trying to say that you want to be in control because, OK, say you own the house, right? And it's in your name. And, it, you know, and what, what do we know? What, what do we know about property records? They're public record. So anyone that knows your name that wants to figure out where you live. You can come figure out because I think that's another reason a lot of these homes are in LLCs because this is such and such LLC and it's uh, and if you get a registered agent and you do it right, they can't figure out who owns the corporation without, you know, doing spending some money. And that knocks out a lot of curiosity seekers and people who are not really serious. So essentially living a life of intent and design is about control. It's about controlling your time and controlling your your life. And when you own stuff, if you don't own it the right way, like say if you have the ability to go out and pay cash for a house, you're ahead of the game. You don't have to deal with mortgage. You don't have to deal with property, mortgage insurance and things like that. Just property taxes and homeowners insurance, which is a pittance compared to what your mortgage is. So in the grander scheme, thinking about controlling stuff like this deal with Carl Icahn and eBay. There's a lot of people on the board of directors who do not own eBay, but because they sit in a control seat, they were able to manipulate, loot, and make a lot of money off of eBay, yet they don't own it. So control and being in the right position is more important than ownership for certain things. So hopefully that cleared that up. Day 13. Yesterday was about creating your own economy. Today is about shaping your own economy. What it is, what it was, what it will be. That was the saying that some of our friends used to uh, greet each other with when we were kids. And it's really eerie how that has become a very telling part of the future because what it is, what it was, and what it will be is all about shaping and creating your own economy. Because, you know, yesterday was about the numbers. Today is about starting that 
whole process of shaping and molding. And there's another thing that happened. Some of these tasks, or you will say, someone emailed me and said, it's a gotcha. It involves you going out and doing things that will move you outside of your comfort zone. For some people, it's terrifying. And I got an email the other day was like stranger danger. I don't like messing with people I don't know. I don't like talking to people I don't know. Then how are you going to introduce your products, your services to people you don't know if you don't like doing those things? I mean, advertising works and marketing works, but it's expensive. So if you've got the bucks to avoid talking to people and even at a certain level to get investors or to really put a face on the company, you still have to talk to people. So work on that fear. That's something that we talk about in the Hustler Mindset Project because it holds people back. It keeps them in the same place. It keeps them um, in a place that is not really good for their long-term future strangers are just friends you haven't met yet think of it that way bam and speaking of that this course is about action every day you're going to be required to do something there's going to be one or two or three or four things and this is something i did this morning tell an inappropriate joke in public to a stranger and I did that this morning. It actually went over very well because I said, do you want to hear a bad joke? It's really, really bad. And there was four people there and they was like, sure. And I told it and three was like fell out. And one was like, I don't get it. And they, oh, OK. Then all of a sudden we had this conversation for 10 minutes. So this is your pitch. You, and if you don't know about jokes, go online, find a joke you like, rehearse it and go tell it to some strangers because this is to move you out of that. I don't like dealing with strangers. They scare me. I see strangers. I mean, don't be that person. If you're that person, move on to change. Because when you develop that ability to go forward and to talk to people, you're going to enrich your life in ways that you cannot even imagine. I had those folks cracking up. And it was a really bad, bad joke. And I made it up myself. Let's get ready to rumble. If you remember the boxing matches before, you know, there was uh, 480 channels on cable and satellite. These were special events. This guy would come out there with that. Let's get ready to rumble. And it, it was just to signify the battle, the fight, the war that was about to happen. Well, as we go into the second leg of 30 days to $2,500, the biggest battle is going to be the enemy is the one within. That's going to be you because all of your problems, all of your um, issues in life stem from you. We like to blame other people, but the only thing you can control is yourself and your emotions. You can't control other people. Now, this isn't if someone does something egregious to you or someone hits you with their car. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about say you've been in the same job for five years and you want to leave that's on you say you are um, in a bad relationship and you want to get out that's on you those things that go on side of you those questions those self-doubts those that's stuff you've got to learn how to manage because one of the biggest things that can help you is learning how to be alone and when I say alone, I'm not just talking about from a relationship standpoint. I'm talking about as an entrepreneur, because if you come from a family of people where everyone has a job and you're talking about starting a business, you immediately caused dissension. You're just like, I don't know about that. I mean, really? Your sister has a job. Your dad has a job. You know, well, what's the job was good enough for us. What's wrong with you? What makes you so special? And you run into that. And you will have to have the intestinal fortitude to chart your own way. And I can tell you, the only thing that's going to change their minds is success. You may have someone that will see your effort and appreciate you more as a person. They'll just like, oh, wow, you know, he or she is for real. I'm just really impressed. And you, you'll get that. But. 
the big turnaround is when you're successful with it. And that's when more people will come on board. And unless you're like a mega success, you know, some people will never come on board. They'll just like, well, you know, you should have did this. You should have did this. People are famous for projecting how you should live your life based on their inadequacy. So when you're hearing a lot of blowback about something that you're doing that isn't crazy, it's not like you're going to go out there and play, you know, poke the tiger in the face with a pen or stuff like that. You're just like, hey, I got a job, but in my spare time, I'm going to create this business. That's a logical sound plan. And if people are going, I don't know, that's their own inadequacy speaking. That's their own fear that's speaking because one of the ways that you will know that you've evolved as a person is when you're going through a personal crisis and you're out in public and you'll see people who are couples are in love and they'll make you smile and you'll see little babies and you'll be happy. You'll be happy for other people, even though you may be personally miserable. That will let you know that you've transcended, that you've become a better person. You're moving to your higher self. And in a short time, you know, whatever's going on in your life, it'll dissipate and it'll move on and you will just get back to rocking it out the way you were. Because when you can be happy for other people in your own misery, that energy, that happy energy is going to come to you and it's going to give you fuel and it's going to help you build and it's going to help you be a better person. It's going to help you get back on the right track faster, whereas you were just hating or being miserable or saying bad stuff because you feel you're operating from a position of lack that, oh, they've got that, but I can't have that. Uh, when you are, oh, that person is living that life and I'm not, there must be some magic jelly beans or their marriage must be horrible or rich people. Are, all, the, all of these soul sucking, cowardly comments you make to make yourself feel better about your own inadequacy. It's pointless. It's a waste of time and it robs you of energy where you can get rid of the inadequacy and then become the great person that you want to be, whatever great is to you. So learn that lesson. And when you learn it well, you will move your life to a higher level. Now, we were talking about, you know, life numbers yesterday. Many people don't understand. You get to pick the number. Some people see that as a chore when really it's a gift. You get to pick the number. Now, part of this is escaping tribalism. You know, say you come from a family of firemen or you're in New York, you come from a family of police officers. It is just expected that since it was good enough for granddad, it should be good enough for little Billy. But little Billy may want to start an Internet company. It's going to it's unfair and this is kind of like one of the 50 laws to hustling is part of that building a king kingdom in the thimble thing that when you have a family member that's trying to break out, it raises up a lot of angst and resentment because there are many people that told the line. Grandpa was a, f a fireman, a uh, police officer. So was great granddad so was dad so was uncle joe uncle billy uncle Ar and all of a sudden you want to break rank it's like you're spitting on the family and it doesn't really have to be like that but that is the power of tribalism tribalism is very powerful it can keep a genius in a dumb position and it takes a certain level as you know if you were here when the youtube video was playing i've said it time and time again one of the hardest things to do is to have the courage to be yourself because many people have what you should be programmed you know i'll take myself as someone said i has a, i have a potty mouth and i used the word fuck too much and i've been cussing on youtube since 2009 sometimes i don't hear anything for weeks months and then it's just all of a sudden people start popping out it's like oh god you know you're using too much profanity you're you're you 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 just uh, you would have more people if you didn't use the profanity and um, you will this will happen and there uh, and there uh. and someone came to me recently January and said that and I showed them the stats January was my best month on YouTube 
<clears throat> yeah, January 2014, my best month on YouTube ever in terms of views and subscribers. And I said, actually, you know, your assessment is incorrect. This is channel is actually growing with me cussing because some people appreciate authenticity. And he's like, okay, you're right. You know, it's just thinking because that's someone projecting what they want. Now, this is the thing. And I'll tell you this. I'm not a professional. Name one YouTube video that I claim to be a professional. I don't hate corporate America. I'm not in love with corporate America, but conundrum media is designed, designed in intent for me, Glendon Cameron, to live my life a certain way. Which means that I will use profanity today and probably in the future. And if that means that someone is going to be, that guy's not for me, then that's what it means. It just means we're incongruent. It doesn't mean that they have to change what they're doing. It doesn't mean I have to change what I'm doing. It just means that there's someone else out there for them that's going to give them the information they want in the manner they want. And that's just the beauty of fairness. So as you grow and you learn about, you can pick what you want you can pick these numbers you can pick your life you can you can do all of this stuff it's just what may be in you what you want may go counter to family friends or you know you might be in another part of the world where that's just like whoa that's kind of crazy dude and i give you a classic example of living a life of intent and design hugh hefner right now everyone loves uncle hugh you see Hugh, he's what, 80 something, 87, 88. He's having sex with 20 year olds. He's got kids all over the place. Name one person that you know that is mad at Hugh Hefner right now. His daughter runs the business. Everyone loves Hugh. They're like, oh, it's a party. Everyone loves him. I mean, you know, granted, he didn't take his Playboy to the levels that Penthouse and Hustler did, he didn't go as deep as they did. But no one has a bad thing to say about him. It's just his hue and his smoking jacket. And I guarantee you, when he passes, there's going to be a lot of people mourning his death. Now, let's compare and contrast that to when he started Playboy in 1955. He was vilified. Uh, he was sued. People called him out for being indecent. So many things happen that, you know, you don't know about unless you do the research. The first 10 years was pretty damn rocky. But he kept on. And that just shows you, um, like when I did my video, The Degree Myth, a lot of blowback. I did it in 2009. And as the recession went on, more and more people agreed with me. So what I'm saying is have the courage to pick your number, pick your life, pick your philosophy and really think about it. And if it sounds, stick with it. And if it works for you, stick with it. And you'll be amazed at what the future may hold. Because uh, one of my favorite authors, uh, Zora Neale Hurston. She was vilified when she wrote her books in the day. Uh, everyone else was writing protest novels. She was writing these love stories and, you know, about black people's lives. They hated on her. They talked about her. She did not get her due as a writer until she was dead. And she writes beautiful stuff. So well, she wrote beautiful stuff. So there's just some things to think about. There's some things about to think about when you're picking your life number. It's up to you. And it's up to no one else or you and your wife or you and your husband because you're a team. Now, this is the big thing. Many people have never made the decision. They have claimed. And this is all about shaping your economy and shaping your life. They've claimed other things that. It was good enough going back to tribalism. There are certain men who will never be married, nor should they ever be married. There are certain women who should never be married, who should never have kids. And uh, many of them know it and they own up to it and they deal with all of the blowback that they get from making that kind of decision. Because the first thing is like, oh, you're selfish. If you know yourself and you know yourself very well and you know that's going to work for you. Go with it. Because if you go counter to your own personal beliefs and the things that you want for your life and then you capitulate to these things that people want for you or feel they're in your best interest, when you don't really give a damn about that stuff, you will be miserable living in the capsule of other people's expectations for your life. The decision. You got to ask yourself, what do I want? What kind of life do I want? I mean, from the 
bungalow cottage with the white picket fence and the 2.8 kids in the, in the Datsun. If that's what you want, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want to be a gypsy and just travel the world and be in a different country every month, get a passport, do your thing. Nothing wrong with that. But you have to pick it. Make a decision. And the really sad thing about this, and this is something that came from Earl Nightingale. A lot of people never really ask this question. They just kind of get a job, start paying bills, get an apartment, buy a house, get a car. And they just kind of start doing stuff with really no rhyme or reason why they're doing it. And it's just like, I did it yesterday, so I'll do it tomorrow. And next thing you know, they're not even going, what the fuck happened? That is the power of the human condition. We get locked into routines so easily that you can get locked into a routine that's counter to what you really want. But since you never made the choice to have a life of design and intent, you don't. So the decision is incumbent on you. And if you didn't make the decision at 20, no worries. If you didn't make it at 30, no worries. If you didn't make it at 40, 50, no worries. You can make it today and start working on that life. Now, another part of the decision is the price. And as you see, the price tag is empty because you have to fill in the price. There's a price to everything. There is no such thing as unconditional love. And I know people are going, what? I love my kids unconditionally. Now, I'm going to challenge some stuff. Like I said, when I put this course together, I know it's going to be some very controversial stuff. And this is going to be one of them. You may love your kids unconditionally, but the thing is, by loving them a certain way, certain expectations, i.e. a price, occur in the relationship. If you loved your kids unconditionally, whatever they did, you just still love them. Your kids can challenge you. They can do stuff. They can do things. But there there creates this price, this um obligation if you so will if you don't like the word price obligation that occurs with parents and offspring that a lot of times isn't rooted in love it's rooted in jealousy it's rooted in um, infantism or it's rooted into some parents actually keep their kids emotionally immature so they will always have someone to lord over so there's a lot of there's a price to everything when you sit down and really think about it. There's a price. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because price is a way of enacting value. So with the price to, you know, let's let's talk about you starting a business. There's a price to starting a business. It could be your time. It could be your free time. It could be your money. It could be your credit. There's a price to starting a business. There's a price to entering into a relationship. There's a price to being alone. There's, you know, let's just go ahead and say, you know, push, pull, yang, yang. The butterfly flaps his wings in the Amazon and then there's a tornado or hurricane in Florida. There is action and reaction. There's a price to everything. The price of having a relationship is you have to compromise. You have to. Well, actually, that's not even true. If you find the right person that you are and that person are really compatible it may not be it may not be compromised. A price of being alone is you get the value of being alone, but when you don't want to be alone, sometimes you're still alone. It's just like it's very hard to shut off. So there's a price to everything. And when you start to understand that, that to get you have to give, then you open up new doors. But when you're just sitting there thinking that you're doing what you're doing and there's little consequences to that then you this is how you get blindsided this is how you get um just totally knocked off of your emotional axis because you're thinking oh there was unconditional love for the wife or the husband or the kid then they do something and you're like what and you start to question yourself and this is when you hear stuff like i i don't know who you are <laughs> you know things like that that's that price tag coming out it's like whoa hold on and it's on the table and you, you, it's never been spoken, but it's always been there. I, I will tell you a story of something I saw, a moment of unconditional love that um, just just kind of blew me away. 
It was in the, it was in the military. It was in the army. Schofield Barracks, 25th Infantry Division. Uh, one of my friends, Beeman. Beeman was just hell. Beeman was... There was something wrong with that boy. It was just something wrong with the boy. That's just the best way I can put it. And Beeman was married. And he did something really stupid. He got an Article 15. He got court martial and he got kicked out of the army. But his wife had a job. So when he got kicked out of the army, they were still in Hawaii. And I was there when he went home and he told her what happened. And understand, this boy was something else. And his wife was just like, that's okay. We'll make it. I love you. She kissed him and walked away. And they were still together. Actually, I think getting kicked out actually did something good for him because he changed at that point. And I think he changed because she didn't know her price was pretty low. There was a price, but it was pretty low because she didn't scream. She didn't do all this other stuff. And she, you know, he was just, uh, he used to call me up and, you know, he just like, can you come get me? I was like, what do you need, man? It's like, man, she's the only one working. I just would feel like an ass getting in the car and using gas when we don't have money. I was like, you know, I just need to get out, man. So I go get him. And her way of handling him, because, I mean, it's the closest thing to unconditional love I've ever seen, made him feel so shitty. He stopped drinking. He stopped smoking. He stopped fucking around. He, he he cheated on her several times. He stopped all of that stuff. And then he started working at the uh, commissary and doing some other stuff. And to my knowledge, he was a much better husband when I left Hawaii. I don't know what went on in the future. But that is the closest thing I've seen in my own eyes of unconditional love when someone does something really egregious. Because he was horrible to her. Before he got kicked out. But when he got kicked out, you know, it created this financial hardship. And uh, like I said, he changed. He totally changed. So there is something close to it. And it can happen. But it's rare. It's very, very rare. Now, this is the most important thing of this, of shaping and creating your own economy. The commitment. This image here is something I did when I joined the military and I went to Montgomery, Alabama. And it was the MEP station. And what they have you do and everyone, everyone stands up and you uh, say the oath to your protective, your your service, whether you're going into the Navy, Army, Marines, whatever. There was all types of Air Force. Everybody was there, even the Coast Guard people. And just the act of saying that condition stuff, because I want you to really think about what happens to our younger people when they join the military. They go in there and they say that oath. They go to basic training. And many of them, many, because it's more than, you know, what you see in the news. Because, you know, it, so many guys were dying that, you know, it just kind of wasn't as um, over the top as it once was. You know, to me, it will always touch me because I could have been one of those guys. You know, I was in during uh, the first desert storm. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons I got out. But when these people, <clears throat> these young people say this oath. They take it very, very seriously, extremely seriously to go out, grab a gun and walk in fire, step on mines, deal with these things that they deal with. And many of them come back hurt, missing limbs, mentally damaged. And some don't come back mentally damaged. and They don't come back bitter. And you talk to them. It's like, well, I took the oath and that's what happened. That's the power of commitment. And. Many people do not make a commitment to having a life of intent and design. There's no commitment. It's just going back to what I said earlier. They were just kind of living. Just, hey, I got an apartment. I got to pay bills. And you start chasing money versus chasing freedom. So with the commitments, there's a, there's a process. If you are not a person that's really good with keeping commitments, you have to start small. For you to think that, hey, you can't keep any commitment. And all of a sudden, you're going to start keeping these huge commitments it's a process. So start with small commitments. And a small commitment is kind of going back to what was in the video. Uh, this year, I had to break a commitment because uh, there was some conflicting things because I screwed up and my calendar was jacked up. That is the first time I have broken a commitment in about 10 years. And it still kind of fucks with me because I don't like doing that. And 
That comes because I used to be a person that was real bad with commitment, would say I would do stuff and never do it. And that stuff adds up. It adds up. So I had to go through this process of stop saying I was going to do stuff and start becoming a doer versus a speaker. It's like, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So it started with small commitments. Like if I said I was going to be somewhere at a certain time, I bust my ass to be there at a certain time. Because what you're doing is building habits. <clears throat> it may seem like it's really, really small, but it's very, very important. If you say you're going to be somewhere at 3 p.m. or before, get there before. Because your habits will define you and they will trip you up. So then you do with the verbal commitments and you keep it. And then you get the habit of commitment. When you get the habit of commitment, then things get a little easier because you start, like I said, I mean, it couldn't be avoided, but I still feel bad. So then you go from the habit of commitment and you can kind of mix all of these up where you have the written commitment, which is your goals. When, when you get all that stuff going together, you become extremely powerful and your life will move in a manner that may startle you at times. It will really, because that's the power. It's more important than talent. It's more important than resources because many people have ripped talent and resources and they end up becoming drug addicts or killing themselves or committing suicide. It's that commitment that is like that ingredient that is so integral to shaping your own economy because it starts small. And as you build a habit and push yourself, then you put out that big, crazy goal and you have the power in the experience of, well, I kept that commitment. I kept that commitment. I kept you develop the belief in yourself that you can do it because you're not flaking out all the time. That's why I don't hang out with flaky people and I don't have flaky friends. Because that flaky energy disrupts success. And they think, well, when something really important comes, I'll be there. And that's where the habit will often trip them up. Now, another part of this is what do you have to give? Because going back to there's a price to everything. If you're giving something that makes it easy to negotiate price or to get your price. So what do you have to give the society? Who are you? What, what, what talent? What skill? What can you give to society that is going to improve society in some aspect? This is my problem with the political machines, both of them, Democrat, Republican, all of them, Fox. Have you ever noticed? And this is something now I know why the commentators do it, because like the Hannity's, the um, Glenn Beck's, the Michelle Makins, all these people like the low people on the totem pole make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's like the occasional reporter. If this is someone with a following been around for a while, they make two to five million a year. Now, the thing is, they talk smack. They do not build products. They do not do services. They keep stuff stirred up and they have a role because there's a bigger part of this, but they don't actually create anything. They just give commentary. So when you're building your business and you're doing stuff, once you actually do something that makes the world just a little bit better, it doesn't have to be, well, when I came up with this product and services improved the world, 10,000. No, it doesn't. It, if you can create a product that makes a kid smile, that's a contribution that does benefit and good things to the world. One of the things with success is people have the ratio of success. Must, it must be this big. It must be this tall for them to identify that success. And that's actually very limiting. Like comedians provide a service. If you have your favorite comedian, you know, someone named one of mine, Bill Burr, you can be having a rotten day. You put your favorite comedian on, it will totally. Uh, a lot of times when I'm having going through stuff, I go through what I call humor therapy and I'll just put it on Pandora and listen to uh, Comedy Central and all this all day long. And I'm cracking up all day. And that just provides that positive energy to push back the crazy stuff. Comedians provide a service. People who make cookies provide a service. People who do massages provide a service. People who make devices and things that make your life better, they provide a service. By becoming a person that gives that type of contribution to the world, you will create much better energy for yourself. And if you have the infrastructure correct, like what we talked about yesterday, then you can make an incredible amount of money. An incredible amount of money. So and started thinking of what can the world give me? What can I give to the world? Just, you know, really, really think about that, because when you become, you know, my video on YouTube, the conduce the consumer versus the producer. When you have a producer mindset more than a consumer, because we're all consumers to a degree. 
But when you're producing way more than you're consuming, your money will reflect it. <laughs> yes, I love the bull and he's moved today. He's not where he was yesterday. Now, this is going to be the craziest thing that you've ever done. And I'm going to have to explain it gently to you. It's role play. What you're going to do is become someone else. Anybody. You can become a British actor. I'll tell you what I did and I'll tell you why I did it. You can become a British actor. You can become a Caribbean. You, anyone. You're going to front a whole day or eight hours at least. You're going to be someone else. Preferably on the weekend if you got a job. And you're going to be in character the whole day. You go to the store. You're going to be that person. You go to the movies. You're going to be that person. You're going to act and behave as someone totally different from who you are. Now I know you're going, Glendon, you are absolutely insane. And to a degree, that assessment would be valid. But this is what I did. And this is how I came up with this exercise. I used to do a lot of voices and some of them I was really, really good because I practiced. I haven't practiced in years, but I used to be able to just do Indian voices, Caribbean voices, British voices. And I discovered that we as Americans are fascinated by accents. You can have a guy that says, hey, how are you doing? And you have a guy, hey, how are you doing? With an accent, and that person is immediately way more interesting than the other person without the accents. I don't know why we're geared that way, but we are. So I had this little uh, British accent I can do. So one day I just got in character and I walked around and I was just acting that way. And I was amazed at the response. People would just start talking. Now, the thing is, some of the people I was doing this, they had seen me before, but we had never had any interaction. So they didn't really know. And I was like, oh, I've seen you before. So where are you from? And I was like, uh, Nottingham. Nottingham is a real place. It really is. I've been there. And it's like, really? I'm sure. And it's like, yes, it exists. You know, and I'm just going on and on. I had all of these conversations with these people because I was faking a British accent. It was just went on all day. It was hilarious. And when you do something like that, you get to get outside of yourself and kind of watch people and how they relate to you. Now, the takeaway is once you do this and you kind of peg what makes people interact with you, you can get the same response without the fakery. Because you'll see these things because I was like, when I had the accent, I felt more bold. I actually felt like I was just the accent actually made me someone different. I was telling it with a friend and he, he was like, are you sure you're not schizophrenic? I was like, I don't know, because it may be maybe it's good. I can actually control the people in me. And, you know, we just laughed it off. But I discovered that by having the same type of energy without the accent, I got the same results. So this is a way for you to actually be outside of yourself and kind of observe yourself doing something else because when you're just being you you can't see what you're doing because you're you unless you meditate if you meditate that makes you highly introspective but i was able to like oh so i went back and i talked to the same people and the, some some of them were like okay yesterday you had a british accent but today he doesn't <laughs> and it went on and went on and went on before 9 11 one of my favorite things to do was go to the airport because uh, you can go to the international concourse and just sit there and just watch all the pageantry of the people that would get off these international flights. And I used to love to watch the Asian stewardess because I'm telling you, they used to like march. They would get off the plane. All of them looked the same. They were the same size and they would be walking like they were in military precision, except they had heels on. It was that would make an awesome YouTube video. There were so many things that happened and they used to go there and get at the bar and I would just write and introduce myself to people and talk because they're if you've ever been to Atlanta in the concourse, you know, there's this big piano and I used to hang out there sometimes. It was just a great way to experience people. But this is your role plan. It's going to take you some time. And this is what I meant about this was going to intensify because, you know, you can't do this tonight. You got to kind of set up for it and uh, you can bring your friends in. You can say, look. I'm taking this course. It's 30 days to 2,500 bucks. And this is one of the things that I have to do. So bring them in, have a conversation. It'll be fun. I'm telling you, it will be fun. You will be cracking up if you do it right. You really will. Now we're going to jump into something that is a sacred cow to many people. And it's something that I used to believe in, but I was pushed out of it due to action and success. 
following your passion is a lie. You know, many people are like, what? Whoa, whoa, that's that's what everyone says. Follow your passion and the money will come. If your passion is collecting ants, probably not. If your passion is sitting on your ass all day, probably not. Follow your passion is one of the greatest lies ever told. It is complete and other bullshit. Now, the truth of the matter is. People follow it because they want to hear that. Because it makes sense. It's like, I mean, I want you to think about it. It's the greatest mind fuck of all. It's the Jedi mind trick times 10. I'm going to come here and I'm going to say, you know what? That thing that you're really passionate about, you're passionate about video games, right? Well, get really passionate about it and really push it. And you can make a living. The money will come. People want to hear that because the truth is to be successful, more than likely, you're going to have to do some shit you don't want to do. And you're probably going to have to do it for a long time. And you're going to have to become good at some shit that you don't really want to do. And that's what happened with me with YouTube videos. When I first started with YouTube videos, I absolutely hated them. I would delay. I would procrastinate. I didn't want to do it. I wasn't good. I felt uncomfortable. I felt weird. I felt awkward. Now, I'm proud of it. And then, this is the thing that happens. When you take something that you do not like to do. Then you practice it and you become good at it. Guess what? You start bragging about that shit. And then you're like, yeah, I'm real passionate about making videos. And then this is where the fuckery comes in. There are many people who are telling you follow your passion that went through the same route that I did with the YouTube videos and other things. And in their mind, they kind of forgot their pathway. They forgot their pathway. And then they're telling you that and they're not like intentionally lying to you. It's more like self duplicity, more so than a grand uh, bamboozlement. But it just sounds good and it makes people feel warm and fuzzy. When the truth of the matter is pick something that you know you can do, whether you like it or not, and really push yourself to excel at it. And you'll be amazed at how freaking often that, that stuff becomes your passion. And this is the thing that happens with that. Your self-esteem and personal self-confidence goes through the roof because you tackled something difficult and challenging and you made it your own. That's where true success comes from, not from follow your passion, just stay happy. Like I said, I, I probably deleted the first few months, 50, 60 videos because it was time I did a video. I didn't turn the camera on. It was the time I did a video and half my face was cut off. It was all kinds of stuff and I just stuck with it because the blog wasn't doing it before I started doing YouTube the blog was getting 20 hits a day it wasn't I wasn't making any sales and I got to YouTube and I linked to the blog and I'm like oh 120 hits a day 200 hits a day oh more sales so I didn't want to do it but I knew I had to do it so with this follow your passion stuff understand You can create your passion. Once again, a life of intent and design. You create the passion, which opens up so many more doors. Because if you're sitting around and think about, what am I passionate about? Passionate about your kids, passionate about your church. You can do well at these, but are they going to make you any money? Probably not. But what can I do? Well, I'm really good at Excel spreadsheets, but I hate that shit. But being good at Excel spreadsheets, making macros and doing stuff for people, that can make you some money. That can create a company for you. So just some for you to chew on. <laughs> just after the role play, after I'm going to have you become someone else, I'm about to kill you off. Tonight, no, I'm not going to kill you. Uh, tonight, you're writing your obituary. I know, very gruesome stuff. What you're going to do is sit down, think about how you want to be remembered. You, what do you want to be remembered for? And what you, you know, it's called reverse engineering and you're going to work your way back. It's like, okay, when I die, this is the legacy I want to live. Uh, this is what I want to have in the world. Then go backwards and then start making that stuff happen because no one, I think wants to die a life of an unremarkable life. I don't think anyone wants to die that way. I think everyone wants to leave a great legacy, uh, friends, family, just a different kind of life. And if you really think about it and you're like, okay, well, you know, you're going to go one day. 
You can plan for that. <laughs> you can plan how you can go out. You can plan for it. And this is also going to be uh, kind of a freaky exercise. Uh, it's probably going to freak you out a little bit. It's also going to um, make you think in terms that you've never thought of. Because when you start thinking about your own uh, life and the end of that life, that forces a lot of questions that maybe you want to answer and maybe you don't want to answer. I did this 10 years ago. Then I did it again about three years ago. Because the thing is, this can change. It doesn't like, you know, carved in stone. Because, you know, as your life grows, as you get better, you can change this up. But it, it's like a reverse map of how you want to live your life. And booyah. Okay. So now <laughs> we're going to answer the questions after I killed you off. Let's get in here. Uh... Manny, I figured it out. I'm going to Lids in the Mall here buying a hat as a prototype. I have a wholesaler that will do 100 hats at 450 each. I'll add value by including a free ticket to the next show with the purchase and a free pick with the DJs. And I will get that done free since I'm a photographer and sell a package for 35 bucks. See what a little thinking does? Congratulations. A little legwork, Dwayne. Ah, uh, like my business owns a ton of tools that I use anytime I want to. Sure, no problem getting into the FB group. Uh, let's see. Wow, Adolphus, I picked up Lead to Feel on cassette at Goodwill last week. Love it. Great information. Yeah, it's some awesome freaking stuff. It's some totally awesome freaking stuff. I highly, highly recommend it to anybody. Yeah, like today's version is a little different. Like I said, uh, tomorrow, you think the day was was a little out there. Tomorrow is going to be even more intense. Okay, so apparently there's, hold on. Sometimes it takes a minute for the questions. Aaron, speak to a British person in your British accent and they probably laugh. Actually, no. I'm going to tell you. Now, this, this is what a nerd I was. I actually know the difference between British accents because this is something a lot of Americans don't know. There's several different. There's RP. There's uh, the North Side. There's uh, Cocky, which is, I guess, like gutter British. There's the Korean. There's several different forms of British accents. So you didn't know I knew that. And I actually had worked on RP because I can watch uh, BBC and get that shit down. So I actually did talk to a British person and he didn't know. Understand, I practice this stuff. A lot. This was during my bum years, so I had a lot of time on my hands, and I would, I would practice eight freaking hours a day. <laughs> Daniqua, all my accents sound like I work at 7 Eleven. <laughs> uh, Tony, I gotta be in the book face to be in the group. Actually, there's a new announcement. Um, once again, when I change the price of 30 days to 2500 bucks. Everyone else that you can go into the Hustler Mindset Project. There's a tab that's only 30 days to $2,500. And it has 12 videos up there. Tomorrow I'll have 13. So you can hit that link and go straight into that. And know you know, because a lot of people are like, I don't want to be on Facebook. I hate Facebook. Um, actually, let's see. Can I? I can't get in there from here. But essentially, I'll send that link out. I'll just send that out to see. I'll send out two emails. I'll just do it because a lot of people hate Facebook. Um, the way, you know, to get our brain spinning so fast, once we get some traction, we're going to tear up some mental payment. I find myself trying to get to the next thing a lot faster than before. Part of this course is I'm trying to create a habit that a habit of action. Going back to what I said about. I didn't, you know, I used to be a bum. I, I really was a bum. I wasn't a good person I could be. I wasn't a good father. I wasn't a good person. I wasn't a good, I was just a mess. And it, it happened because I was ap apathetic and I, I wasn't doing anything. I did a lot of talking, but I really wasn't doing anything. So over a course of a few months, I changed my speaking action ratio and I flipped it. Like I was speaking 90% of the time. So I just became about action between 90% of the time. And it just totally changed my life. So that's the habit. That's why, you know, every day there's some you have to do because it'll become a habit. Like you do the full 30 days, you're going to feel weird if you're not like pushing because it's, it's the indoctrination of a new habit. 
Um, Jelani, so we'll be writing possibly our own will and a list of instructions to surviving relatives. No, you will not. You will be writing what's going to be on your tombstone. You're going to be writing how you want to be remembered. No, no will. Unless you want to. Susan. Uh, I wish I had heard about living a life of intent about 30 years ago. It, yeah, a lot of people don't realize they have a choice. They just think that they got to do what their family tells them. Jelini, so if I leave a file with passwords and instructions for various accounts. Once again, yeah, you could do that. Josh, after completing the story, how to start a book or ebook? Mm, not sure. How's that? I, the cock in the East End London accent, you've got to spend some time with someone that does it because if you've ever been to London and you've been around people who, if you pay attention, you can hear it. You can hear it because like the people in Parliament, the upper crust, they use RP and the cockney stuff. I mean, sometimes it's kind of like you don't understand what the hell they're saying. I can do a pretty big Houdini accent. <laughs> David sat on his ass, made ten thousand dollars a K reasonable epitaph. No, you ain't that bright son. <laughs> I have family in London. I mean, London's a different kind of place now. They got a lot of stuff going on. Oh, okay. You're from the Southeast. It, it's, it's different because that's like the laborers and stuff. And some of them speak. If you don't not paying attention, you won't know what the hell they're saying. But, you know, like I said, for that goal, you can be anyone you want to. You can use an accent if you want to. It's just fun. It just gets you out of your normal routine. Okay, looks like that is all of the questions, and I'm actually under time today. Uh, I was trying not to go over. I'm trying to keep this consistent. PN, what are ways to tell that a market is too saturated? Let's discuss. If there's a lot of players in the market, that tells you that the market is viable, and it's a battle of positioning. Saturated is a term that's just used for that's hard to get in that market because let's just say you ever driven on the street and there was like a gas station on each corner. You know, it's like you would think there would only be one. If there's a bunch of people in the market, I'll give you like romance novels. Biggest genre in writing there is. Every month new offers enter into it and make money. So the better question is, do you want to deal with the work that is involved in being successful in that market versus if it's too saturated? So selling soap. Uh, there's someone that's taking this who sells soap and she's actually increased her soap sales using this course. So this is what I ha this is what I want you to understand. There's soap out there, but there's not your soap. There's not your spin. Like this business course I'm doing. There's a lot of business courses out there, but they don't have my life path as a guide for the course. So my course is probably 70% different from other stuff out there. And there are people who would take it and go, oh God, hell no. And there's other people like, I'm loving this shit. So essentially, there's something for everyone. The market's big. It's just really what you want to do with it. Jasmine. <laughs> oh, my God. I was wanting to sell soap. That's too funny. Carla. So, Glennon, can I really buy a home to live in under my business name? Yes, you can. How does that work? I know this may sound silly, but I'm so new to this. If, first of all, you would have to have cash. That's part of it. Or you would have to have a very old corporation with a great uh, paydex and credit profile. But say you say you had 200, 300, 400,000, whatever you needed to buy a house, you buy the house and you put it in your business name. Now, I would say you wouldn't put it in your business business name. You would create a new LLC and put the house under that. And it would be like you own it, you control it, but you don't own it. And mm -hmm. from an estate standing plan, don't take this as, you know, because you have to check with your account. But say you have an LLC and you put your kids on it. So they've always been on it. So when you die, there's no estate tax. 
Now, don't correct me on that because, you know, the law changes every every year. Uh, Chris, a local college is offering free small business development seminar for for business for pre-business planning. Worth checking out or can I learn everything here with you? I would say go take that course and compare and contrast what you learn from that course with this course because they're going to give you LLC things you should do because I'm not covering stuff that you can get on the Internet for free. I'm doing stuff that I've done that works for me. So you're probably going to get some different information. So it would probably be a benefit to you. Leslie Ann, how did you handle cash, large windfalls, safe banks, converts to metals? If I told you, I had to kill you. Uh, essentially, when you have a business, handling cash is not a problem. Tony, best ways to get organized. I'm doing too much and accomplishing too little. Uh, go to the course. Yeah, you're going to have to pay for that one. But there's the power of six. It's a priority type method that will improve your productivity to amazing levels. Dwayne, okay. Old Ted Kennedy's car was in a separate corporate identity, and Mary Jo's family couldn't touch him. LLCs, trust, etc., all provide a layer of insulation legally for good or ill. Yes, they do. See, that's what people don't understand. It's like go with the Kennedys. Let's let's talk about them. And the America's, you know, closest thing to royalty that was started on crime. They put together, there are certain trust and irrevocable things that they had in place in the 50s and 60s that these people are still using that money. And I don't care what they do, you can't get to it. I'm, I'm telling you, structure is everything. Eddie, I had this discussion with my wife yesterday. She says she wants to start a blog and write a book. I say write your book, then you build your blog around the product you and your book. What do you think? Uh, I would say she can do both. She can like write the book and make have the blog become a book. She's all right. Let me slow down. Say she knows that she wants to write a book. She goes ahead and writes the blog and she puts it out there and she gets feedback and she can change the blog around. And then when she's done with wherever she needs to be, she can turn the blog into a book. So she can do both. You know, sure thing, Chris. Byron, how does this course contrast to Hustler University? Hustler University, once I'm finished with this, is going to go into some mastermind stuff. It's going to go into some seriously different stuff. This course is designed to take a person who's never had a business within 30 days to having a business and making 2,500 bucks. The Hustler University, the Hustler Mindset Project, I'm putting those together is designed for the person who's past that. Like in this course, we've got people making 200,000 a year, 300,000 a year. One guy is probably going to do half a mil this year. And it's going to be for them to take their mentality and their business skills to the next level. Because when you take, like I'm a member of a mastermind group. And whenever we sit down and talk, I always get ideas because I'm talking to people who are doing similar things that I'm doing. So it's going to be more of that. And it'll be much smaller. I made this course because the data dictated that's what people wanted. Yeah, the power of six is awesome. The way you put your luxury car in a separate independent LLC when it comes time to just sell, just sell the LLC and the buyer pays no DME taxes and you're selling the corporation with his examples. The way knows a lot about this. I'm telling you. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to turn Hustle University into the Hustle Mindset Project. That's one of the reasons that I changed the pricing structure. Uh, you'll have to sign up for 30 days to 2,500. It's in there. Because the thing is, this course is designed. Every day hooks into another day and it keeps pushing you and pushing you. And, you know, I, I had to slow it down because right now we're doing weekends so people can catch up. But the next thing there that come will be more intensive. Jasmine, I don't want to get too much in your pockets, but what can you compare your success to money wise? That is my barometer for success is freedom. I will tell you, I make far less money than I did in the storage auction business, but I don't have thirty, forty thousand dollars in overhead anymore either. So my value system has changed. It is about freedom. I do stuff to keep me free. It's a little hard to understand because when you've owned stuff and you've been the man or the woman, you, you know what that feels like. So it's no big thing to you. If you never had it, it just seems like the best place in the world.
the way things going into the freedom aspect is so important. Never be a slave to a bank. Leaking free to slaves. Visa got them back. <laughs> Yeah, you can incorporate in Bermuda and have assets there. Uh, David, how much time do you spend nowadays on stealth projects like romance ebooks? I'm actually getting ready to start a new series after I finish this course because this is the primary thing in the reshaping Hustle You and the Hustle Mindset project. That's where all my energy is going. And then the two books, uh, The 50 Laws of Hustling and then The Hustle Nomics. So I'm not working on that stuff right now. Byron, what happens when the 30 days are up? Does it repeat? Uh, no. It's going to be a course, a paid course, and I'm going to enhance it a little bit. It's currently 99 bucks a month if you sign up for it now, and it's uh, 300 bucks lifetime. I'm going to add a lot more stuff to it. Yep, that's true. An offshore corporation can act as a trustee or a trust. There's a lot of things you can do with corporations that people don't understand. Okay. I mean, you know, this is the beauty of doing this stuff. You can um, put together a seriously interesting portfolio of stuff. Uh, JJ, you know, this is from Dwayne. JJ Luna writes some good privacy books that cover a lot of the LLC for privacy barriers. Because there used to be this website. Well, this it was a catalog. It was Lumponics, L O O Lumponics or Lumpanics. And I got some crazy good books from them that was kind of dealing with some of that stuff. When you know, when you had to like send in money orders or order stuff in the mail, you know, it's not like it is now. So that was a great site for that stuff. Because the thing is, just to give you, um, just a, a quick thing. Say you have a couple making a hundred thousand dollars, right? And they both have jobs. They're going to lose thirty-eight to forty thousand dollars of that due to taxes. So you have a couple, and they have a a company, and they're making a hundred thousand dollars. <throat> they could actually have that company depreciate and make absolutely no money. Both of them driving luxury cars. They're not paying federal tax. There, there, just there's so many things you can do, and that's like if you remember what happened with Mitt Romney, and people are like, "How can you make all that money and pay no taxes? LLCs, trusts, tax. I mean, that's why this whole thing about Tax the rich is propaganda for poverty minded people because it's never going to happen. Get, who is writing these laws? Rich people, congressmen, most many congress people are millionaires. You think they're going to write a law that's going to rob their pockets? That's why this is never going to happen. Okay, it's 502. I'm going to shut this down. I will be here again 4 p.m. tomorrow. I will send out the um, announcement for the webinar because some people are having like problems with the link. The link should be the same every day. And I also will send out the link to join only. I'll just, there'll be the only thing that'll come out. Those two things, the link to join the, my private video group. All right. With that, I will see you on the good side. And my battery died. That's too funny. And it's back. <laughs> All right. <laughs>